Hi folks, Ed Amorosa here from Tag Cyber, and I'm sitting with my good friend Jake Kaplan, who is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Synac. Welcome to New York. Thanks, Ed. It's great to be here. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, we had a pretty, uh, pretty humid uh, week this week. Um, maybe next time you come, it'll be nice and cool, and we can take uh, a nice I have the show. cool weather out in San Francisco. It's okay. There you go. There you go. <laughs> hey, tell, tell me a little bit about yourself. How'd you get into this business? Yeah, so uh, we got started about four and a half years ago. Um, I came out of the NSA before starting the company, moved out to the Bay Area um, right around the time we got started. Um, uh, but before that, we actually uh, spent a few months in Boston, which is actually really where we started the company. We went through an accelerator program there um, called Techstars, um, uh, about a four month curriculum, mm -hmm. got some VC funding out in the Bay Area. And they said, hey, you know, this is a great place to build the company. We, said, we decided. It was the right place to build the company, and um, we've been going at it ever since. We're now over uh, 110 people now, um, and growing very, very quickly. You know, I got to back you up some. So you were yeah, at NSA. Yeah. yeah. Now uh, you're in college, and then does an NSA recruiter come? I think you you might have been part of a cyber corps, right? Yeah. How did that all happen? How'd you how'd you get to NSA? Yeah. So I was part of the cyber corps program over at uh, GW University yeah. in DC. Um, basically, they go pay for school, then almost like ROTC for cybersecurity yeah. nerds yeah. like myself, um, and then you go work for a federal agency afterwards, um, and NSA was the agency I worked for. I was really fortunate to work in an incredibly um, exciting department at NSA, um, uh, formerly known as TAO, Taylor right, Access Operations, right, right. which uh, I don't know if that's still the name, but I believe I they changed it. a few things. <laughs> um, but uh, more on the offensive side of the mission, incredibly fulfilling job, and it was a great way to launch a career in cybersecurity. Did you get to pick NSA? You have a lot of different options, or did they sort of pick you? Um, so they sort of pick you. Mm. Um, you know, you I must did, have gotten all A's. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> uh, I did spend a couple of summer, in, summers uh, interning at the Defense Information Systems Agency. Yeah. Doing some red teaming incident response, wow. um, and then ultimately move over to the intelligence side over at NSA. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's such a good um, transition from kind of college to learning to then starting the company. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's exactly right. Yep. Now, if you had to describe for folks kind of what Synac does, um, you're on the edge of a lot of different things. Like some people think pen testing, bug bounty, crowdsourcing, vulnerability. There's probably a whole circle of things. How do you describe it when people ask what you guys do? Yeah, I mean, I think if you back up a little bit um, and you examine kind of the work we were doing at NSA, one of the things you certainly recognize in that job is that the vulnerabilities are pervasive. Mm -hmm. um, they're everywhere, and if you have the right resources, motivation, and expertise, you're probably going to get in. Right. Um, and I think what that gives you an appreciation for is just how fundamentally broken penetration testing and security assessments are today how the old way of doing things with the consulting firms or the automated tools has become highly commoditized. Um, and we recognized we had to do it differently. And so the approach that we take is using this more crowdsourced methodology. We recruit, vet, and retain this global network of top white hat security researchers in over 50 different countries. Um, and we pay them more on a success model. So not time materials, but we pay them when they're successful at breaking into mm. a customer, we pay them based on the impact to that organization. Um, and then we layer that with a whole bunch of really cool technology that we're building for scalability and to create some efficiency in that researcher network that we employ um, uh, as they perform their work. How do you find them? And, and do they have to take like one of those tests that I see online to get a job at Google? Like, is there some sort of? Is there something like that? Yeah. So. Um, you know, we take pride in bringing on the best security researchers around the world. We're not just a company that says, if you have an email address, come sign up. Um, we um, actually put our researchers through a rigor of not only background checks, of course, for trust, um, but we also do things like technical uh, interviews and mm -hmm. examinations. Um, so based on that researcher's expertise, we'll put them through a series of um, practical exams. Um, it could be web application security, um, mobile application security, network mm -hmm. infrastructure, um, and they actually have to find the vulnerabilities in a real live environment for us to know that this guy is as good as they think they are. Um, and it helps us make sure we maintain a bar that's as high as our customers expect from us. And I think it's one of the issues in uh, consulting today in pen testing. Um, a lot of the people doing the work are very 
checkbox driven. Um, they don't really understand the technical details behind um, just those, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're trying to make sure we move that ball forward um, and it's definitely working. We actually only accept about 10% of the people that apply to be part of the community so it is a pretty elite community of folks um, but they're incredibly good at what they do. How do you make sure bad guys don't find their way in? Yeah, so obviously the veracity of that network is paramount to our business. We gotta know we can trust these researchers. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do things like background checks. We actually interview every single one, whether it's through video or live. Um, and, uh, and then we also audit their traffic and activity. We, we ha actually route them all through us. Um, and we have full logs of what they're doing, which is really important to our customer base. You know, we're really targeting the conservative Fortune 500, Global 2000, sure. as well as federal government, federal and state uh, and local governments. Um, and these are organizations that need to have trust baked into the model. And when you talk about crowdsourcing and security, those two words didn't really belong in the same sentence maybe five mm -hmm. years ago. Um, but today it's becoming more and more possible. And it's actually, I think, the new way of doing this type of work and I think is the future. Does this group collaborate? Like when they, when you, you decide on someone, you meet a young lady, she's fantastic, passes the test, you say this is great. Does she then become part of a group or is she more kind of working on her own or is it a com com combination? I'm trying to think what, what it's like to be someone yeah, you know, in in that mode, is it more solitary, more group, or how, you know, how is that like? It's collaborative, almost in an anonymized way. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, no researcher knows what another researcher is finding. Um, they don't under, They don't know the specifics of any vulnerability that they find because we just do not want to be a dictionary of attacks mm -hmm. uh, for any particular customer. Um, but with that said, we want to give them some visibility into what other researchers are doing from a coverage perspective because ultimately we want to maintain and achieve holistic coverage across our customers' environments. Mm -hmm. And so what we surface to our researchers is uh, some basic information on what have other people looked at and where are they finding the vulnerabilities and, ho and hopefully focus their energy on the areas that people haven't looked at yet. Mm -hmm. um, in the crowdsource model, uh, testing is very ad hoc unless you can provide that data and the analytics behind what people are actually doing. That's interesting. Have you ever had a case where there's been a vulnerability that's been brought to you where the researcher or the team is saying, whoa, this is kind of scary, like some serious critical infrastructure consequence? Like, do you ever jump in and maybe guide the disclosure process carefully. I'm, I'm sort of imagining that the vast majority of things that are found mm -hmm. are vulnerabilities, need to be attended to, customer finds out, they're grateful. There's probably a lot of, you know, I'm guessing 90 something, the high percent, but there must be some cases where you look and you say, wow, this is a, yeah. do you, what, what, does that happen? And, and if it does, what do you do? Yeah. So. Um, given that we maintain an internal vulnerability operations group that uh, reviews every single vulnerability that comes in before we flow it through to a customer, we're in a position where we can actually start to chain some of these vulnerabilities together, mm -hmm. which could mean that we can find something way more impactful. Some weird than one aggregation. Thing, exactly. Right, right, one right. thing standing alone. And so um, we can really help customers understand the impact of these issues beyond just like you said, here is a vulnerability, here is maybe the CVSS score, mm -hmm. um, to something that's actually bus uh, you know, a business impactful case. Um, and when you can describe it to them in those type of terms, um, their ability to articulate to their higher ups and to even their developers as to why this is so important um, becomes so much more real and meaningful than just here is a report, um, go fix this issue. Um, uh, and I think that's what we really need today. People need mm. to start understanding why, um, not just what. Interesting. Now you guys have built a platform. You have a lot of automation around what you do. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. So it's not just a bunch of pen testers banging away. There's some platform support for this. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that. You know, what we recognized early on is that people are fundamentally important in this equation of finding vulnerabilities, right? But there is a, a, a finite supply of these folks. And to the extent that we can make these people more efficient in mm -hmm. what they're doing, um, we're in a much better position. 
And so what we've done is built a, a technology platform that we call Hydra at Synac. The whole purpose of Hydra is to better enable the researchers to be more efficient. Right. And so we'll do things like scanning for rudimentary level vulnerabilities and we'll say, hey researcher, we think there might be an issue here, we want you mm. to take a look at this. Uh, we'll do things like change detection. We'll say, hey researcher, we've noticed it's detected, or detected a change in this customer's environment here. Change is indicative of a potential new issue. Why don't you focus your energy wow. here? Um, and this uh, technology gets smarter and smarter over time, right? The more we can bake into the technology and automate, um, the more we can level up the researchers and make them focus on the things that are actually really difficult to find and the things that are likely to matter more to our customers. Mm, awesome. um, and so really we've bridged this gap between man and machine. We've brought the two together and we've married them in such a way that it's just a much more effective solution than just people alone or just machine alone. Um, and given the crowdsource model of engaging with 50, 100 people all at once, the efficacy levels are through the roof compared to anything else on the market. You know, I bet there's a lot of people watching you and I right now on their iPhone. And they're saying, well, it sounds great, Jay's awesome, cool stuff, but there's no way my company can afford this. We have three people doing IT, you know, one person doing security. Do you think that this kind of technology and the, and, and the assistance it provides a security team, do you think that comes down market at some point? Are you seeing that a little bit? I know it's probably the case that you probably deal more with bigger companies that have bigger supplies of vulnerabilities, but I'm just sort of thinking forward. Uh, do you think mid, smaller, is, is there some hope for those folks at, at yeah, some point? Absolutely. I mean, we're working across the board at this point. Mm -hmm. um, certainly it is a more premium solution, right? Sure. Um, and you get what you pay it for. It always right? starts that way though, absolutely. right? I mean, good, cool things start there and they move down. I'm, I'm yeah. hoping that this will move down market a little. The great thing about what we're building is because our technology is getting smarter and smarter over time, it's enabling us to add a lot of efficiency and drive drive costs a little bit lower. Um, we've created a new model that goes beyond our continuous penetration testing offering. Um, in the very early days, we were very focused on driving customers towards this notion of, you shouldn't be testing point in time, you, you really should be looking at things ongoing, right? You're pushing out code all the time, your infrastructure is mm. highly dynamic. Um, you can't just look at this once a year. Um, but we do recognize that for either smaller customers or for customers who have thousands of applications, doing things co uh, continuously 365 days a year might not make sense for everything. And so we've created a more point in time product, um, more akin to a typical penetration test that enables a customer to engage over a two week period and it's much lower in price. Wow, actually that's great accessible. Idea to a smaller company. And so we are happy to engage with both small, medium, and large businesses Absolutely. alike. Um, and we can do it today. You know what, in advance of a merger, the security team should probably order up one of those for the potential acquired party or a yep. third party you're about to, to do business with. Yep set them up and get some feedback over a period of time. There's a lot of opportunity. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up. A lot of our larger customers have used Synac as an acquisition, yeah. uh, part of their acquisition strategy. Um, basically saying, hey, you know, we're doing 100 acquisitions a year. We have no way of keeping up with making sure that these acquisitions are secure before we bring them into our portfolio, or especially our technology portfolio. Um, can you guys basically do a full analysis a really very rapidly idea. on demand? Obviously, we're very elastic given the crowdsource model, um, and we're able to scale up very efficiently. I think I'm going to write about that. I love that idea. Yeah, like third that. party is such a mess right now. It really is. I, can, I would say nine out of 10 problems the security team has live on the fringes. Yep. They live on the fringes, and most of those fringes are some weird deal that somebody did, and that's probably, I'm, I'm gonna guess that a lot of things that get ordered up from you, by, you know, for your team within an, an engagement with a, um, a, a customer, probably is fringe stuff. You know, it's yeah. very rarely come to our website, companyname.com, and you find a bunch of buffer overflows. It's probably never the case. Probably all this weird stuff, something somebody set up. Am I reading that right? Yeah, I mean, I, think you, see, I think you see both, right? Um, the, the reality is getting more eyes on these applications and network environments means just finding more stuff. Mm. Um, and it happens both in the fringe cases and yeah. bringing new, you know, uh, merging companies into, you know, through acquisitions into your organization's technology. 
um, or just even legacy staff that's Ooh. been sitting out there for a really long time. Look, we're doing a ton of work today with the Department of Defense, the mm -hmm. Internal Revenue Service, amongst other federal agencies, um, and they ha are they're sitting on you know environments that have been out there for a very long time, and they yeah. house tons of sensitive data. Um, and obviously, they've gone through many, many pen tests and have employed many different services. Um, but the crowdsourcing model is proving to work. It's finding stuff yeah. they just didn't know about before, and stuff that would be pretty detrimental to. Um, both brand and our data. I want to ask you about do domain specific, kind of looking forward, um, just about everybody watching this mm -hmm. video probably would say that IoT, industrial control, these big electromechanical things in factories and cars and you know uh, autonomous vehicles, it's like this future it tends to blend OT and IT, right? Mm -hmm. These operational technologies are touching um, IT and changing the way we do everything. You know, yeah. you, I read about all these cool things Elon Musk is doing. It's really, yeah. really exciting. I can't wait for them to come. But I would imagine that the security issues there are just going to be immense. I, and, and when I think about your business model, I think it might have an advantage because you can bring domain specific folks, like somebody who understands automotive design. Yep. future design, mm -hmm. that kind of person who maybe marries a little bit of that with some hacking knowledge. Yep. Do, am, I, am I saying that right? Like, do you think domain mm -hmm. specific will be an important area? It's probably not as easy to cover because yep. you need a couple of people who do what they do, but yeah. what, what are your plans there? Well, obviously we're in a very advantageous position given the fact that we can recruit globally um, on a freelance basis. We don't have to hire these folks. and. I think everyone recognizes today there's a massive supply and demand uh, problem and mismatch in cybersecurity. Um, I think the numbers are, uh, you know, three and a half million open cybersecurity jobs by 2021. I mean, th that's a big number. And then when you start to think about and consider, you know, these more um, connected devices and, um, uh, you know, even just our critical infrastructure and people who can actually do testing on these type of very specialized environments that becomes even more difficult. Yeah. Um, given our model, we can recruit any type of expertise that is necessary for our customers' problems. And you know, we're doing it today on very specialized targets across the federal government, on embedded devices, malware reversing, you, know, you name it, we can do it. Um, certainly, some expertise is a little bit harder to recruit for than others. Um, you know, there's a lot of precedents in web application security, mobile application security, network infrastructure. Um, you know, these new te technologies, they're just, people haven't been looking at them uh, as long as, you know, the stuff that's been out there for a while. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, while it is harder, we, we do have the expertise on hand and we're helping customers with those problems today. You know, you have such an interesting background, academic, government, business. Well, let me ask sort of an introspective future question for you. Can't wait to hear what you say about this. but. When you think about the, these nation state attacks that seem to be so successful, and, and what I would perceive, tell me if you agree, like the, a widening gap between offensive skill and defensive skill, it seems like that's still happening. Maybe you tell me if you agree, but it seems like when I look, there's a, a case to be made that things are getting kind of worse and that it's easier to break into stuff and easier to break into things that have real consequence to society. Mm -hmm power systems and so on. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're sitting chatting with people at a cocktail party or something, and maybe they're not in the tech industry, they find out what you do, and they say, oh, Jay, I hear, I hear about all this um, hacking of power. Hey, are, are we going to get hacked into the Stone Ages right. here? What, what do you think? Like, I know it, it's hard. When you're a CEO, I know you have to be positive. Mm -hmm. and, and, but I'm just wondering, it, is there a case to be made that maybe there's some bad things that can happen in the future? What, what do you think when you, when you get introspective about that? Yeah. I mean, look, I think the reality is that the vast majority of these sophisticated attacks, I was on that side, are not that hard. Pretty simple, yeah. You know, we're, yeah. we're leaving the, the doors wide open. And um, you know, it's a real, really the reason we started this company is because until we can fix 
the basics, how are we supposed to defend against the, the sophisticated zero days that are the out there? The Stuxnet type Yeah, attacks. exactly. I mean, you look at WannaCry as a prime example. I mean, it's just a failure of patch management. Yeah. I mean, this was an O-Day that was patched and people just didn't bother to update their, their, yeah. their Windows devices. Um, until we can get ahead of that, I mean, we can't really start talking about the sophistication of um, O days by that are stockpiled by some but of these companies. But let me ask, I, I'm t with you totally. Yeah. I think that there, if you and I are bad guys and yeah. the doors open, we're we'll walking in, right? Sure. I mean, and if there's a lot of doors open, then it is absolutely reasonable and valuable and correct right. to go around and say, "Hey, doors open." But I'm worried that even when the door is shut. Mm -hmm. I look at some of the exploits, some um, remote jailbreaks and some zero days where you go, whoa, this was not some dopey kid somewhere, you know, some yeah. countries that are good. I, I worry that they can even get around some of, the, some of the more sophisticated defenses that we can put up. It, do you think once we kind of get through and sweep through that first round, I hope in the next couple of years, of closing some of these doors, do you think we're going to have to take it to the next level? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I said during an RSA talk in 2016 uh, that our entire nation's critical infrastructure is completely owned. Yeah. Um, that uh, there's implants. I agree with that. There's by implants the way. everywhere. Um, we're not detecting it, and if a nation state wanted to turn any of the, the those implants on and you know shut down our, our power grid, you know, water utilities, et cetera, they have the means to do it. Um, uh, with that said, you know, I think we need to start really advancing how we go about the problem. I think um, it is too sophisticated for the normal, you know, solutions that right. we've been using all right. along. Right. Um, these more progressively leaning uh, technology solutions um, that are innovative and cutting edge um, are exactly what the government needs to start leveraging to make sure that these critical infrastructure systems are secured. Um, and it needs to be what every business is looking at today. And it's, you know, what's Synax all about and probably what a lot of other companies that you've been talking to are, are working on today. I hope you keep doing what you're doing. I know a lot of it is cleaning up some basics. I hope that as you guys grow and become more influential that you do both the easy stuff and I think you do some hard stuff too for some consequential uh, customers so we thank do you both easy and hard end but yeah I know yeah. appreciate it thanks so much for All having the me above. here no it was great having yeah. you next time you're in New York um, we sit down and we chat again that sounds great you're awesome thanks, thanks so much Jay. appreciate it we'll see you next time